This was about a year and a half ago, when I had just moved into an apartment with a friend. It was a small, one-bedroom apartment that was technically a converted attic in a very old house. My roommate, R, spent most of her time in the apartment, directly below where her boyfriend and my bandmate, D, lived. So I spent a lot of time upstairs in the attic, alone. She was able to supply most of the furniture that we used, but my family is also very thrifty, and I buy anything second-hand if I can. One day, when I was visiting my folks, my mom brought in a black side table that she had found at a local thrift store. She was going to try to sell it because it was very old and had a real bakelite handle, but it was the perfect size for my apartment. It was only $2, so she let me take it home with me. The day I took it home and cleaned it out, I could tell something was off. I'm a pretty empathetic person and can feel when things aren't right, even if I can't really explain why or how I know that. The table was about three feet tall and had a small drawer at the top. And from the drawer down to the bottom was a large sort of cabinet space, but with no door, so it was just open. I remember looking into that space and feeling uneasy for some reason. Like it was too dark for the amount of light that was in the room. Or it was too big of a space for such a small table. I couldn't put my finger on it. I cleaned it anyway and placed it between the futon in the living room and the door to the bedroom on its left. It wasn't long before the odd feeling began to be justified. One day, I was walking out of the bedroom into the living room, and right after I crossed the threshold next to the table, I heard a growl. Let it be known, I am very aware of audio and visual matrixing, so I immediately tried to recreate the noise by walking on the wood floor again in the same spot. I tried every spot in that space, and none of it squeaked or made any sort of noise. In fact, for how old the house was, the floors were very solid and made hardly any noise at all. But I had heard a growl, and it was to my left in the space where the table stood. I brushed it off and continued as normal for a couple of weeks, until one day when I was about to leave the apartment. I had turned on the light that illuminated the stairwell, leading down to my front door, but then realised I'd forgotten something. I went into the bedroom to grab it, and when I came back out... The light was off. I checked the switch immediately, but it was the one that was wired to another switch at the bottom of the stairs. So sometimes even when it's switched on, it might be off because the one at the bottom was technically switched off. I couldn't remember which way I'd flipped it and decided it could have been wiring problems. I brushed it off again and went on as normal for a bit longer. Little things like that happened pretty consistently for a couple of months but it was never enough to make me feel anything substantial was actually happening. I just grew more and more uneasy. I could never fully close a door. I slept with the bedroom door open, showered with the bathroom door open. I always felt watched, but I had no evidence to support it. One hot summer day, I was alone in the apartment, in the bedroom recording some music with the door closed because the window AC unit in the living room was pretty loud. I remember specifically closing the door because I didn't want to have to edit out white noise in the background. I recorded and jammed for about an hour and when I got up to have a pee break, I opened the bedroom door to silence. I walked over to the AC to see that it had been switched off. Mind you, it's not something that can be accidentally switched off. The knobs click onto place and have to be moved with several pounds of force. It wasn't an electrical issue, the knob had been turned. My memory backpedaled. Did I really close the door because of the AC or because of downstairs noise? The neighbours are kind of noisy and tend to slam doors so maybe that was why I closed mine. I did my business and went back into record, closing the bedroom door again. Another hour or two passed, and I started to pack things up. I opened the bedroom door to head to the kitchen, and guess what was turned back on? 
the AC unit. The knob had clicked over two spots, from off past low fan all the way to low cool. I finally felt justified for being uneasy. Something actually happened that I couldn't explain no matter how hard I tried. But I didn't want to worry my friends or family, and I decided not to say anything. I said some prayers and hoped that whatever was causing this would see itself out. Unfortunately, around this time, I got really sick with mono. I ended up taking about two months off of work, and R&D stayed downstairs pretty much 24-7 to keep away from my germs. My parents didn't really visit me or anything, but I went to their house a lot to have dinner so that I could eat a meal and not just ramen and pretzels every day. As I was being a potato day in and day out and no longer gone nine hours a day at my desk job, I started to notice more strangeness happening. It was a smell. I'd be lying down watching TV and a whiff of something rotting would come out of nowhere. It would stay for a couple of seconds max and then it would be gone. I sniffed the futon, the floor, the bathroom, the bedroom, even stuck my face down in the kitchen trash but none of it smelled like that. I took the kitchen trash all the way outside, but when I came back in, that quick little waft of hot garbage continued. For weeks, it would come and go at random. Eventually, I found it to be localized to my stairs. There was nothing to cause a smell in the stairwell because there was nothing in the stairwell. What was weird was that as soon as you opened the door and stepped onto the second floor hallway, the smell would be gone, replaced by the smell of dog and Dee's puppy. The first floor smelled like old house and dryer sheets from the basement laundry. One day, after I had mostly recovered from the virus, R came upstairs to hang out on the futon and watch YouTube for a while. I told her about some of the things I'd been hearing and seeing, and it turned out that she shared some of the same experiences. All of a sudden, on the wall behind us, there was a loud knock. R, did you hear that? Me. Yeah, it was weird. But this is an old house, so it might be wood settling. Ah, oh, it sounded like someone banged on the wall. Me. Yeah, it happens sometimes. I'm sure it's just because we're in the attic. Truthfully, I had never heard that before. And I've lived in many old houses that have settled like that. It was too close to us, too perfect of timing, and way too loud to be a coincidence. I don't believe in coincidences anyway. One day, I was in Dee's apartment chilling with his cat, while R quickly went outside with the dog. I was sitting in the kitchen which was directly underneath the living room and bathroom of my apartment upstairs. While I was sitting there, I heard slow and heavy footsteps upstairs go from one end of the room to the other. With me on the second floor, R outside and Dee gone to work, there was no one left to be on the third floor my apartment was empty. Later, I asked R if she ever heard me walking around up there, and she said no. It was like no one lived there. It didn't surprise me, because I'm light-footed, but it did scare me, because I could only imagine how big someone would have to be to make loud footsteps like that. At this point, I was still deep in post-viral fatigue, and had to quit my job altogether. I was getting ready to move out of the apartment and back home when one day, I got a series of Snapchat videos from R. Dee's cats going nuts downstairs, jumping at the walls in the hallway between the kitchen and living room. He was meowing and looking up at the ceiling, following something invisible with his eyes into corners and along the upper parts of the walls. It went on for several minutes. This cat never meowed and wasn't very playful. He mostly just chilled and slept everywhere, and so R and I were a bit unnerved by the sudden change of behaviour. I later realised that he, where he was freaking out in the hall was directly underneath where my little black side table sat in the attic apartment. All of these things together had become too much for me and my parents helped me move out of my apartment as fast as possible. When I had finally told them everything that was happening, they insisted on helping me gather what I would need for the next couple of days, 
and would hire movers for the rest of it later. My mom finally opened up to me as we were packing. The reason they never came to visit me was because they got an uneasy feeling every time they came over and she had noticed the smell as well. I couldn't blame her. If I had followed my gut feeling at first, I wouldn't have stayed either. But it crept up on me so slowly, it seemed to gaslight me whenever I questioned my surroundings. That day, we made a couple of trips between the houses with a gap after lunch for rest. When we went back later in the afternoon, the door to my apartment was wide open. R had been in D's apartment all day, so I asked if she had gone in and maybe forgot to close the door. She said no. She saw that the door was open, but figured we were still there. I specifically remember closing and locking the door, and my mom does too. She watched me do it. She even described the specific way I stood to lock the door, off to the left with one foot on the stairs, which she wouldn't have known otherwise because she hardly ever visited. At this point, I no longer felt safe. As we were packing up my last day in the apartment, the smell came back. This time, the trash was empty. It had been taken out yesterday. There wasn't even a bag in it. My mom and dad were both there, but neither of them could smell it. We got more bags of clothes and blankets, more music gear, and my bookcase. As we began to leave, the sky opened up. I know it rains hard in Pennsylvania, but this was torrential. I had a lamp in one hand and my favourite bass guitar in the other with no case. My dad suggested we wait a minute for it to let up, but it started coming down in buckets. He ran the bookcase out to the car anyway, and mom and I waited on the porch. What did we do? I don't know. As we waited, it turned into borderline hurricane levels of wind and rain. The huge trees across the street were bending dangerously. The wind whipped through leaves so hard, sending rain down so fiercely, we had to yell to be heard standing right next to each other. It started to rain sideways, covering us even under the shelter of the porch. The only way I can describe it is that it was coming from all directions. I could actually see it coming sideways from left, right and centre. The rain covered my glasses. The wind blew so hard that we were pushed back on our heels, almost falling over each other. I want to get out of here. I don't care anymore. As soon as everything was loaded in the cars, the wind died down. By the time we got to my parents' house, it was sprinkling. Within an hour, the sun was out and the sky was a vivid, almost cloudless blue. It hadn't clicked with me yet that the side table might have been the clue to everything. And so it came home with my parents and me. I remember sitting in the kitchen and telling my mom that I felt like it was staring at me. She said she'd get rid of it as soon as possible and went back to the thrift store. A day or two goes by and my mom makes a trip to see her friend who owns a local antique shop. The woman who owns it has bought the little black end table with the baked light handle and placed it in a vignette next to a desk which is topped with various small vintage pieces. Mirrors, cards, a terracotta pot with a crown sitting just inside. My mom warned her about the little table, explaining what had happened to us just previously. During this conversation, they both hear a loud clank. The crown that had been sitting in the pot was lying on the floor, four or five feet away from the table where it rested, as if it had been picked up and flung away. The little black end table was take it back to the thrift store for the final time. About 11 years ago, a close friend of mine passed away. He was in a horrible head-on collision on the highway after having missed his pills and blacking out behind the wheel. The first inclination that something was wrong happened in the form of a gut feeling I often get when something horrible like that happens. I get the sense that something is terribly wrong somewhere and I never know why at the time I feel it. It throws my day off until I hear the news. In this case, the news came to me the following day. However, when I felt it was the night, it happened. Bad feelings aside, 
I went to visit with the usual gang to console everyone over the news that our friend had passed. I learned that his old roommate had received duplicate texts from him, which was hours after his death, each reading exactly, I'm on my way home now. This hit me particularly hard at the time, and it still haunts me a bit. One final strange thing about this whole arc of events took place about a year or so later. The last place my friend had been before his death was Toronto. He had been visiting a friend there and was on his way home when the accident took place. Around a year later, I found myself in that city for school. I was walking home one day after roaming around the Eaton Centre, passing through Dundas Square. This area is normally very busy during the day, and this was no exception. I passed by someone I was walking down a side street which cut through the university grounds and caught a glimpse of his face in passing. At first I thought, damn, he looked really familiar. Then it hit me just who it reminded me of. I double took and glanced at him as he walked away, and it struck me that this person was the spitting image of my friend. Could have been a coincidence, of course, but that really rattled me. And of course, I wasn't going to approach a random person and try to converse with them about such a thing out of the blue. That moment stuck with me though. It was as if I had witnessed his ghost or a doppelganger. I live with my grandparents and my parents live in an RV parked in the yard. One night, I was leaving the RV to go to the house and I heard the strangest noise I had ever heard. I'll do my best to describe it. It was like a deep wheeze. So at first, I actually thought it was my dad having a coughing fit. He's a heavy smoker. So I called out to him, with no response. The best I can describe it is like a pig's squeal, overlapped by the sound of an ape roaring or a goat screaming out in pain, with a deep wheeze to the sound. I just stood frozen for a second before I started to feel uneasy as hell. Mind you, it was pitch black outside, so I couldn't see a thing. I called out for my dad one more time without moving from my spot. When I got no response again, I turned around and ran back into the RV. My mom and brother were directly inside, and I guess they could see the horror on my face because they immediately started asking what was wrong. It all happened so quickly, but I was suddenly shaking and pale. First thing I did was ask where dad was, the answer to which was in the back sleeping. I was really freaked out at this point and told them about the sound. My family is not crazy religious, but we are Christian, and my mom insisted only a demon could make a sound like that. I had her walk me back to the house that night and every night after for about a month. It left me afraid to go outside at night for quite some time. The strangest thing to me was all I did was hear a loud noise, yet it filled me with so much fear for so long. I spent ages researching different animals and the sounds they make, obviously focusing on animals that frequent my area, and have found nothing close to the sound I heard. My friend used to live in this apartment that he swore up and down was haunted. He would always tell us stories about hearing noises and objects being thrown from his countertops. We had stayed over on multiple occasions, but never saw anything out of the ordinary. There were even times where we sat in the dark and tried to ask whatever it was to make a noise or move a door. Still nothing. It eventually got to the point that we just assumed he was messing with us because he would never see or hear anything, but he had all these crazy stories. One night though, that all changed. We had all gathered at his apartment to stay the night because we were going to an event in the morning and were going to all ride together. That night, we played poker and had some drinks. One of our friends had too much to drink and went to empty his stomach out in the restroom. Being childish as we were, we kept messing with him to the point that he just locked the bathroom door and stayed in there most of the night. 
The owner of the apartment went to bed in his room, which left three of us in the living room alone. It was a one-bedroom apartment, so the living room was where us three would stay for the night. For some strange reason, us three grown adults decided to make a giant pillow fort. During this alcohol-fueled construction project, we had set up a large tent for three, with a small fan blowing air inside to keep us cool. We had turned off the lights and decided to go to sleep. Here's where the encounter starts. Shortly after the lights went out, maybe 15 or 20 minutes, we started to hear footsteps. Given that we had been messing with our poor friend from the bathroom, it was presumed to be him returning the favour. I peeked out from under the blanket roof on our fort to see the bathroom door was still closed and the light showing from under the door crack. You could also see that the bedroom was still closed, with the flashing of the TV showing from under that door. Confused, one of the other guys in the fort looked out from the other side and didn't see anything. We continued hearing footsteps every now and then, but could not see anything. We were all getting a little confused and just ready for someone to pop out and scare us. Not long after, this humming noise began. It began to grow louder and louder. It wasn't like a musical humming, but more mechanical. It eventually got loud enough to sound like car engines from outside. This was even more confusing, given that it was 3 or 4 a.m. and outside was just a parking lot. The noise sounded like the engines were racing, which didn't make sense. It eventually got to a stable audio level, to where it sounded like being under a highway overpass and the constant hum of vehicles going over it. Now all of this happened within one to two minutes and all three of us were talking and brainstorming about what could be making the noise while this was happening. During all of this, the footsteps were still audible outside of the pillow fort. All of our confusion came to an end when we saw a little spot of light in the darkness. Our friend had a cat which was lighter coloured and it looked like he had walked right in front of the fan we had placed on the edge of the fort. We all had a sigh of relief to see that it was the cat that was walking in front of the fan, making the noise and who was probably making all the footstep noises. Now, the living room was very dark and the only light was street lamps from the parking lot shining through the windows. It was still hard to make out the cat, but it was a lighter ball shape in the darkness. I started to make little pss 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 noises to the cat to get him to walk into the fort with us. It worked. At this point, we realised that the cat did not look more cat-like as it got closer. It stayed that same little ball shape. The orb slowly moved over my legs and my friend's legs and there was no feeling when it went over us. It was almost as if it was floating. Still thinking this could be the cat, I reached out to pet it. As soon as my fingers touched the ball, it disappeared. Immediately, the humming noise stopped and the room was completely silent, aside from the fan blowing. All three of us sat there in the dark and one of my friends just yelled, What the fuck was that? Completely startled by what had just happened, the other friend just kept yelling for one of us to turn on the lights. Nobody wanted to leave the pillow fort. We eventually used the flashlights from our phone to scan the room and kitchen and turned on a light. Needless to say, we dismantled the fort right after and stayed up until around 6 when the sun came up. We went to the event very tired, but we did have quite the story to tell on the way there. Late at night in the summer, there were some families gathered for a birthday party at my friend's farmhouse. Most of the people had already left, but we stayed because our families were good friends. They had set up a fire outside and everybody was gathered around it. There were four of us kids in the group and we were all around nine or ten or so. Behind the fire gathering was a medium sized hill, which us four decided to run up to the top and roll down. We did this a couple of times and enjoyed ourselves. From the top of the hill, you could see the farmhouse facing straight forward, and off to the side of the hill was a barn. There was a light somewhere near us that allowed it to where our shadows were showing on the side of the barn. So we would continue going up the hill, 
see our shadows and sometimes try to make little shadow puppets and such. Now here's where the spooky part comes. One of the times that we've climbed the hill, we decided to try and make letters with our body shadows on the barn wall. We had all lined up four in a row and noticed there was a fifth shadow on the barn. A little confused, we looked around at each other, looking to see if there was a fifth person up there with us, but there wasn't. I remember looking back at the barn and the fifth shadow, which hadn't moved at all, immediately took off in a running motion and disappeared from view. This startled all of us and we ran back down to the hill to our parents in the fire. Not sure what it was that we saw, but it definitely freaked us out and it's something we still bring up every now and then and are still a little spooked by. Myself and my partner rented our first house back in 2012. Nothing creepy or particularly off-putting about it. Just a standard terraced house on a street of identical houses in a northern town in England. My partner, now wife, was pregnant at the time, so we needed somewhere to bring up our first child. We chose this one as it was in an area we were familiar with and the rent was affordable. When we first moved in, everything was normal. Just a standard house and we set about getting furnishings and all the usual stuff. I used to take my wife to work early in the morning and I'd drop her off and come back home. The front door opened directly into the living room and there was a sliding door from this room which went into the kitchen. This had a door going out the back to an enclosed yard shared with nearby houses and the stairs leading upstairs. There was also a frosted glass window next to the sliding door which was presumably once a serving hatch but now just served to let some natural light in as the sun never got to the front of the house due to the narrow street and surrounding houses. Within a few weeks of moving in, I developed a weird feeling like something was watching me through the window. It wasn't overpowering, but it did get to the point whereby I'd actively avoided looking at it out of the corner of my eye as some part of me was always worried I might see something on the other side looking back. I'd always been deeply skeptical of anything paranormal, so always tried to ignore it or laugh it off as just me being stupid and what was an unfamiliar house. That said, the feeling became stronger to the point that after dropping my wife at work, I'd come home and catch a few hours on the sofa in the living room as I didn't want to go into the kitchen and up the stairs to bed. The feeling was definitely strongest in the kitchen and on the stairs. And the only way I can describe it is it felt predatory. Like the constant nagging feeling that something was either watching you or right over your shoulder about to rush you, even though there was nothing there. Things seriously escalated after one particular evening. We were watching a Darren Brown TV show where he was disproving the idea of the paranormal and seances. Part of the show asks you to perform a Ouija board at home and the premise was that he would lead the responses and tell you what results you would get, thereby removing any idea of it being anything more than suggestion and parlor trick. My skeptical nature combined with my wife's belief in the paranormal meant that I was keen to go along with this, to prove how silly her beliefs were. We started the Ouija board and went along with all the instructions, except we didn't get the results the show said we would we got something far more sinister. When we asked the name of any spirit, rather than the scripted name we were supposed to get, we got the name Ernest. By this point I'm laughing, thinking my wife is pranking me and that Ernest is a stupid name to come up with. My wife isn't laughing though and says we should stop. Thinking that it's all her, I go along with it. Do you like us living here, Ernest? No. Why not, Ernest? What do you think of me? rogue. Now, it's worth mentioning that this confused me. My only experience with the word rogue was as various classes and video games. Okay, what do you think of wife's name? Whore. Wife is getting more upset and by this point is really quite distressed. 
we follow the rules and say goodbye. The glass we were using as a plancher goes to goodbye. The board we were using was made out of scraps of paper with letters and numbers in the usual yes, no, hello, goodbye on them. As my wife was so freaked out by this, I collected them together, put them in a glass bowl and took them out to the yard and burned them. Partially for her peace of mind, partially for my own. That night, we had gone to bed and around 20 or so minutes after we got in bed, we heard a loud bang that came from downstairs. I went downstairs to check everything, thinking something may have fallen over. But everything was still in place, so I went back to bed. As we lived in a terraced house, I told my wife it might be because the neighbours were banging on the cupboard door and went to sleep. The next night, we went to bed. Within the first half hour of being in bed, the exact same bang from downstairs. This happened every night, no matter what time we went to bed, whether it was 9pm or 1am. Within half an hour, we heard the same bang, always at least once, sometimes twice. We tried to replicate it, and after everything, we discovered that a heavy cupboard door in the corner of the kitchen, when opened, then let go, made the same exact noise. I was pretty intrigued and keen to find out what it was, as we'd never had any signs of pests or vermin and the cupboard was fixed to the wall about six feet off the ground. So I asked my wife to let me set up a camera in the kitchen, recording after we went to bed. She wouldn't let me though, as she said she'd either didn't want to know, or didn't want to antagonise it if it was anything. Things really began to go downhill from here. We would find ourselves arguing over the smallest thing, having full-blown shouting arguments for hours over nothing. Despite normally being a very chilled out person, often accused of being too laid back, I found myself constantly on edge in a combination of what I can only describe as anger slash anxiety. This didn't happen overnight and was something that built up slowly with both of us, to the point I didn't notice it was happening until much later. There was no waking up a different person moment, but a slow and subtle change. Despite never having had before I began suffering nightmares on a regular basis. I would have vivid dreams of family members dying in horrific ways, such as being burned alive. I would wake up screaming or in tears, and my wife would have to spend an hour reassuring me they weren't real and calming me down. Most disturbing was when she said that she'd wake up and toss and turn due to being heavily pregnant, and I'd be laid there with my eyes wide open, staring blankly, like I was asleep but with my eyes open, and when she told me to close them, I would, with no other reaction or comment. I have absolutely no recollection of ever doing this, and have never done this at any point before or since living in that place. The arguments continued and got worse. The regular bang at night continued, and the overall sense that something was following me, particularly in the kitchen and stairwell, became more and more overpowering that despite my best efforts to convince myself I was being ridiculous and trying to for force myself to walk slowly, I was clearing that flight of stairs three steps at a time, filled with adrenaline and my heart pounding in my ears. There was a brief lull in activity in the month or so before our child was born. It was around Christmas and the arguments had abated and we seemed to get back to ourselves. I thought we turned a corner. The nightly bang persisted but we'd become so used to it, we would now just look at each other and roll our eyes. My wife told me that the kitchen and living room window and the sense of being watched or followed was something she was experiencing too. Then, our little boy was born and everything was okay for the first week or so, but the atmosphere soon began to change. The sense of anger and anxiety began to creep back in and we started to bicker. The atmosphere was made worse as our newborn baby would just cry constantly every hour of the day when he was in the house. He'd sleep for 20 minute intervals and the rest of the time would be spent trying to nurse, wind, feed, distract, play, anything to try and soothe them, but nothing worked. We had him back and forth to hospitals and doctors so many times in the first few months, but inevitably when we got there he was calm and sleeping or gurgling happily. 
the doctors would look at us like we were crazy. And I was beginning to think I was cracking up myself. But then we got home and the crying would begin again. We were taken in turns to see him at night, but this wasn't helped by the fact I was now apparently doing the weird sleeping with eyes open thing again. It culminated for me one night when I was laid in bed, waiting for the inevitable cry to start, when I saw a shadow form in the corner nearest the window and begin to slowly move across the fitted wardrobes we had in the room. I initially thought it was being created by the curtains against the headlights of a car moving slowly down the road, but it wasn't moving right. The best comparison I can make is like that of ink being dropped into water. The room was dark to try and help our boy sleep, but this was darker than the rest of the room, like a very rich black and seemed to have shapes like smoky tendrils coming off of it. I laid and watched as it inched along the cupboards and then watched it go around a corner and continue on the wall. I knew at this point it wasn't a shadow, as a shadow would have jumped from the wardrobe to the wall, not creep around a corner that was facing in the opposite direction of the window. I watched it go out of the door and on the stairs. Now if this was to happen now, I would have noped straight out of the room. But at the time, I remember being oddly mesmerised by it and only starting to feel any kind of fear after it left the room. I resolved not to tell my wife as we'd already experienced enough weirdness to be on edge and the idea that I may have just seen a manifestation would have probably upset her even more. It was winter at this point and the house was constantly cold, not helped by how dark it was due to sunlight being unable to make its way in. No matter what we tried, we couldn't get the place to maintain a constant, comfortable temperature. One room may be red hot, but the other next to it freezing, despite the heating being set to the same throughout the house. The rooms which experienced hot or cold varied from hour to hour. The temperature would spike in a room only to fall again to uncomfortably cold in the space of half an hour. We had a room thermometer for our baby, and we were having to constantly move from room to room to try and find one that was relatively normal. Unfortunately, I found this one place in the house where the temperature remained the most stable, was the stairs and landing. So I'd find myself having to sit there fighting the rising anxiety to run, because it was the one room where our child could either not be overheating or wrapped in blankets against the cold. Around this time, I remember a dream quite clearly where I was talking with a woman, no idea who she was, and saying how dark and cold the house was. She asked me if I knew what that meant. I said no. I remember even how when she said that life needs to light to grow, the only thing that can thrive in darkness is death. It may have been my overactive paranoia or subconscious, but I clearly remember waking up with those words still in my head. Now, when I hear a lot of these stories, I often wonder why people didn't just get out. There's usually excuses about not wanting to surrender their home and fighting for their house. Well, this wasn't our house. We were renting it and all the combined problems and weirdness got too much. We decided we had to move. We found a house a few miles away and gave our notice on the place. It was the night before we were due to move and in the early hours of the morning, we heard a piercing siren. We had a carbon monoxide alarm and it was going off. We opened all the doors and windows and got outside. My wife and our boy went to my parents while I waited for the gas engineer. He arrived and immediately condemned the gas fire we had in the living room, which had started leaking carbon monoxide. It's difficult not to think about that without the alarm we could have all been dead and the fact it happened on the day we were due to leave. I couldn't shake the idea that the two were linked and something either wanted us not to leave or to give us a parting gift. I'd like to say we move and everything was better overnight. It wasn't. The new house started out okay but the nagging feeling of being followed around slowly crept back. Not as intense but noticeably there. In this house, we all shared a bedroom and had a lot of stuff still packed in boxes and generally cluttered in a spare room. One of them was a bouncer for our baby. 
This was a Fisher-Price frog type bouncer and had eyes on the front which, when rolled, would play a tune. Around 4am one morning and the frog tune starts going off. I immediately look to the crib next to our bed, thinking our baby might have gotten out somehow and started playing with it, but he was fast asleep. I did everything I could to get it off again without spinning the eyes, knocking, hitting the floor around it. I tried to tell myself it was maybe the batteries, but this was the only time it ever happened and we didn't have to change the batteries for the next two years or so we had it. The feeling of being watched grew. Only now it was strongest from a conservatory on the back of the property. My wife and I had been through enough by this point and we were now openly discussing the weird feelings with each other. There was a set of double doors between the kitchen and conservatory and this one particular night my wife asked that I close them. I didn't ask why, but did so. About an hour or so later, I decided to go out for a cigarette. As I opened the doors, the glass panelled French doors of the conservatory were in front of me. It was dark outside, so all I could see in the doors was the reflection of the lit kitchen behind me. As I walked towards the doors, I see in the reflection, very clearly, a black silhouette of a person running behind me. Almost like it was run to the house through the exterior wall and straight through to under the stairs. My first thought was that it was something outside. But as I checked, no one was there. I stood there smoking and thinking and realised it couldn't have been outside as the figure passed behind me and was briefly obscured by my own reflection. So it had to have been in the room behind me. I quickly finished my cigarette and went back inside. I sat there mulling it over before telling my wife the next day, to which she said she had wanted the door shut as she hadn't felt comfortable about that room all day, more so than usual. We had a similar instance a month or so later, which could have ended badly. Whilst driving and pulling onto the motorway slip road, my wife all of a sudden jumped on the brakes. When I asked her what the hell she was doing, she said a dark figure had just run out in front of the car. There was literally no one around as the slip road was in a wooded area, away from any built up spots or paths. I didn't see this myself as I was in the back of the car with our boy, but my mother-in-law was in the front and she said she saw it too and was equally spooked. Gradually since then, the feelings of anxiety and tension subsided and we eventually moved again. Mirroring our experience of leaving the last place though, on the day we were moving, we were taking our belongings down the drive to a van when a roof tile slid off and narrowly missed me or my brother-in-law who was helping us. We moved to a new house, which out of all should have been the most haunted, having been built earlier than the others in the 1830s. This house, however, was the most tranquil and had no such weird atmospheres or happenings. All this was around six to eight years ago now and we often walk past the first house and have seen it come up for rent many times since, so nobody seems to stay there long. The funny thing is, we both said a few times how when we see it on the market, we both have a desire to go back. We've even talked about going for a fake viewing just to walk around the place. We never have. But even the idea that after everything we still feel an urge to go back to it is something which the rational part of my brain can't really explain. I'm so tempted to go back through all the old census records to see if Ernest ever lived in that house, but so far I've resisted the temptation to take it all over for fear of setting something off again. That, and if finding out that someone did, well, I don't know what I'd like the answer. So I'm employed as a policeman and I work the night shift in a tiny little town. The population here barely breaks a thousand. Needless to say, I know the town well enough to be able to tell when something is off. Near the center of town, there's the old school they used before they built the new elementary and high schools. The building is listed as a historical site and the building can't be demolished, but due to asbestos, Renovations would cost the town too much to be worth the work. This school sits within feet of the public library, 
and behind sits the town's fairground. It isn't an official fairground, but every year they had bull riding and small child shows they put on in the summer. With all of these details out of the way, I'll explain what happened. I noticed the backlight to the library on, which isn't normal since it wasn't all night and it isn't a motion light. So I parked on the north side of the old school grounds. I walked through the fence and had to pass the school to get to the library. I would stop every few feet and listen because the gravel was so loud. When I stopped the second or third time, I thought I heard a squeak in the school, like a door. And at first, I didn't think anything of it, since I figured I was hearing things. The town just replaced all of the windows on this building, so I thought I wouldn't hear the inside. When I investigated the light and found all the doors locked, I was walking back around to my car. As I walked by the school, again I heard a noise in the building, and I stopped and listened, and shined my light, noticing a basement window was broken out. So when I walked up to the window, I looked down and didn't see anything. I kept walking, and I heard the squeal again. It reminded me of those bathroom doors in schools that the hinges always squealed really loud and echoed. When I came around the corner, I saw two cats roughhousing in the dirt. They stopped to watch me, and then both of them turned and looked at a door I couldn't see myself, because it was around another corner. One hissed, and they both bolted away from the school, which put me on edge. I know the school is absolutely not in use, nor are there any plans to use this school anytime soon. Also, the local kids and homeless don't come here, ever. It's a landmark the city as a whole really admires, and hasn't ever been an issue with breaking and entering for a long time. So when I came around the corner, I saw the door, and I walked up to it to see what the cats had run from. I looked for other animals, but that didn't make sense because they looked up as if someone was standing in the window of the door. Not like they would if there was a raccoon or dog that ran off without me seeing. When I looked in the window with my light, I could see a gigantic Raggedy Andy painted on the wall, and I assumed this was the kindergarten section or something. And then I stepped back from the door getting ready to leave, and I heard whistling. It wasn't really loud, but it was loud enough to make me stop. That little voice in the back of my head was talking now and telling me I was just hearing things. But the dude that likes the dump of fear of the unknown told me to go back to the door. So I went back and listened again, and I knew it was whistling, and not like the squeak of an animal or object from inside. It got louder when I came to the door again, and it had a tune, but I didn't know how to describe it. So now, thinking someone was in the school, I went around and checked all the doors, including the second floor door that I had to climb the rusty metal stairs that were more like a death trap. When I couldn't find a way into the school, I checked it all over again. When I left, I couldn't figure out what it was. The whistling had stopped, and I even hung outside for a few minutes without my light on, just watching, figuring if someone was inside. They would eventually need to use a light to get around or back out, but there was nothing after 20 or so minutes. So I got in my car, circled the block, and parked down the way with my lights off to watch for someone to come out at some point. But no one did, and there weren't any lights inside. I have two younger brothers, and I'm the oldest. All three of us have had this room at different points growing up, and it's currently my room now. When I was young, my mum said that I would talk about the old man in my room, and say that he would just stand in the corner. She said that I was never scared of him, and that I was never that bothered by it. I would always describe him as standing in the same corner of my room, and that he would always smile at me. I grew out of it fairly quickly, and would only mention him on and off for about a year. This is a fairly common thing, and can be explained away pretty easily, if it weren't for the fact that my two brothers that had the room after me, would also describe the exact same thing and even point to the same corner when talking about him. They weren't scared of it either. 
My youngest brother was the only one of us that never got my granddad. And would tell my parents things like, Granddad read a story last night, and Granddad came to see me last night, but still pointed to the same place. I only found out about this a couple of years ago, and it was already in my room again by the time, and both my brothers had stopped mentioning it a while ago by then. My parents obviously never mentioned it to us as kids, so we all talked about it without having any clue we'd all experienced it. We never mentioned it to each other, and none of us can remember anything, as we were all pretty young. I don't really experience anything strange in the room now. My bed is currently in the corner of the room we all said we saw him in. The only strange thing I've experienced since is a breathing noise right by my ear when I'm trying to sleep, but I don't feel scared by it. I'm also pretty sure it's just something normal, like the air moving around the room. I know there are much creepier and interesting stories around, but I just thought it was a little weird and might be worth posting. I don't actually believe my room or house is haunted by an old man, but it's such a strange coincidence that we've all mentioned the same thing at different points. I'm certain that I didn't take the idea into either of my brother's heads as I'd already grown out of it by the time my first brother was born and completely forgot about it. At the beginning of my freshman year in high school, my mum was diagnosed with late stage ovarian cancer. It was a huge blow for my family, and especially for me since my dad wasn't around for most of my childhood and she was the only parent I had. With some context provided, I can get to the actual story I wanted to share. It happened about three months after my mum was diagnosed. My school was organising a bunch of Catholic retreats for upcoming Christmas. The retreats would mainly consist of meeting with missionaries, telling about their journeys and people from our school attending masses together. My relationship with God and faith was mostly on and off for the majority of my life. I come from a devoted Christian family, but I lean more to the agnostic view of the world. I didn't really care for the retreats, but I signed up for them anyway in order not to upset my mom who already has, was an emotional wreck. On the first day I attended, I decided that I would go to the missionary meeting, but I would skip the mass with the rest of the people in my group. After leaving the school and heading down the road to the nearest bus stop, I saw a homeless man asking people for money. I have severe social anxiety and hate dealing with these types of situations, so deep down, I prayed that someone would give him money and the guy wouldn't bother me. But unfortunately, nobody gave him anything and he walked up to me. He looked fairly normal. He had a long grey beard and was wearing a puffy black coat, a rosary wrapped around his right hand. He introduced himself as Marius, I'm Polish, and it's a pretty common name here. Told me that he was recently released from prison and he needs a bit of money. I'm not the type of guy who thinks that every homeless person wants to use the money given to them for alcohol or drugs, or judges them based on their appearance. So I started to look for some change in my wallet. While I was searching for money, Marius expressed his gratitude and also repeated the story about being released from jail. And out of the blue, he said he can see ghosts. I didn't pay that much attention to it, thinking that he was probably mentally ill. After giving him the money, he thanked me for it and extended his hand for a handshake. I shook his hand, then instantaneously, he put his other hand on mine and said something to the extent of, I know your mother is very sick. Go to church and pray. God will surely help you. After hearing that, I was completely dumbfounded. I didn't go to the church, but went straight to the bus stop. After that happened, I saw him maybe twice, and every time I did, I had the intense feeling that he was looking straight at me. After those events, I've never seen him again, and throughout the two and a half years of high school, I've never told the story to anybody, not even my mom. And I hate myself for it, because she passed away more than 15 months ago in a hospice. And maybe if she knew about it, she would have accepted her death much easier. Here's some background. My girlfriend has always had super vivid dreams and nightmares. 
However, they've always been relatively similar to real life and included no paranormal activity. Until now. About three days ago, she had a nightmare which involved a monster slash ghost holding her up by her ankle. I thought nothing of her at the time, but now I think it's connected to what happened. I was at her house, because we live separately, and we were laying in bed when we started hearing sounds. At first, it was the obvious buzzing of a bug, and one actually came inside through the open window. We both felt like we were being watched as well. Her room is on the ground floor, and outside the window is mostly gravel, so the crunch of footsteps is very noticeable from where she sleeps. We both heard what sounded like scuttling on the gravel, and started to feel uncomfortable. She got up twice to look out the window, only to see no one. I heard light breathing from outside, but did nothing so as not to scare her. Both of us were uneasy and felt strange. She heard me talking that I didn't hear, and went to check the window only to find nothing. It started to get late, and so she took me home. In the car, she told me a lot about a lot of the paranormal stuff she'd seen and experienced. As I was saying goodbye, I leaned to give her a kiss. I thought I saw something. There isn't any good way to describe it. It was grey-faced and had very slanted eyes. Its body seemed to be so dark, it wasn't there. It had a large smile and was the stuff of nightmares. I only saw her for a split second and said nothing to my girlfriend because I didn't want to scare her. She later told me that she thought someone was in her back seat. And so she drove with the windows down, music blasting and kept checking her back seat until she got home. Earlier today, when I told her exactly what I saw, she said that it was what she dreamed about as well. This was the strangest thing I've ever experienced, and I don't know if anything will top it. So when I was a kid, I live in a small town in Minnesota. Now, I live in an even smaller town, but compared to most others, it was still pretty small. I was quite young when this started, I'd say about seven or eight years old. I was sitting in my bedroom on one gorgeous afternoon, about 85 degrees outside and a cool breeze coming in through the window. My parents were at the dinner table outside my doorway chatting. As we had just finished dinner half an hour ago, and they tended to linger around to have a conversation. I was playing with my toy cards when I just kind of felt like someone was there. I whispered a small hello and was surprised to hear someone respond. It was a girl about my age. We talked for almost the whole afternoon and at about 4 p.m. I went to talk to my dad. He listened and was pretending to be intrigued but blew it off as an imaginary friend. Her name was Catherine. She would hurt, but didn't know why. Fast forward to when I'm about nine years old. It's mid-autumn and my family is raking leaves. To our surprise, the neighbors from across the streets call us over to talk. They asked for us for some of the leaves. They needed some to cover their flowers over the winter. We agreed and my dad stayed and talked with them. He mentioned my imaginary friend. He was in for a surprise. These neighbours were older and had lost their daughter 11 years ago, who was hit in the road in front of their house by a motorcycle with no known driver. Her name was Catherine. And she never knew what, what hit her. We were shocked to hear this, as there were resemblances that were almost scary. The stories matched and every day since then has been eerie. Afterward, things started happening and our life fell into a downward spiral. My parents had their midlife crisis. Our home was investigated by a couple of crews who both said I had a very strong presence that seemed innocent. I was diagnosed with depression and my parents had gotten abusive to each other and divorced. I moved with my mom and we just happened to have purchased three porcelain angels as decoration. Things started calming down and we started to financially recover. As for my dad, life was far from improving. It was my dad's weekend with my and my little sister three weeks later, and he was starting to get closer to an old friend of his. She had gotten him three porcelain angels, which he had let sit in the boxes. 
he continued to fall farther and farther into debt and getting hit with a harsh look. Until the next time we visited him, we arrived at my dad's house and I saw the angels were still in their boxes on the dinner table. And I suggested that he open them and set the porcelain angels up somewhere as decoration. He did. And as he was doing it, the air seemed so still. It felt like the whole world came to a halt to watch. They were up and sitting on a decorative hutch. After that, everything improved for him as well. I'm almost 17 years old and that still affects me daily. I communicate with Catherine, but she's still not completely at rest. So my boyfriend and I have lived in our current apartment for about a year with one of the roommates. We all get along decently well for the most part. However, right away after moving in, we began to have strange experiences that always seem to revolve around our roommate. I'm talking about full on, full figure black shadow people, weird nightmares, us all having the same or similar nightmares in the same night, everything. It started with seeing head and shoulder silhouettes peeking into our room from the hallway or from places in his room when we walked by. My boyfriend at one point ended up seeing the full face of a man with a beard standing approximately six feet tall, looking in at us again from the hallway. My roommate came to me on a separate occasion to tell me he had seen the same man without knowing what my boyfriend had told me. The strangest part is whatever it is won't cross the threshold to our bedroom, only his. It also mimics his voice. There have been multiple times now my boyfriend and I have been together in the kitchen and we'll hear our roommate talking, laughing, even coughing when we know he's not in there. Every time it's happened, I've poked my head into the hallway and found his room with the door open. Pitch black inside. I do things to keep our space as safe as possible and I've heard coughing on more than one occasion from his room when I'm home alone and lighting incense or sage. I've burned incense and sage when he is home as well and on more than one instance he's burst into my room asking if I'm burning sage before I've even gotten it to light. So realistically before he should be able to smell it. He's told us before he used to hang out with people who used Ouija boards and he openly mocked and made fun of the entities that were being contacted. There have been several nights where my boyfriend and I both have nightmares about getting our throats cut and we'll talk about it to just each other. And then my roommate would come to me later on and tell me about a weird nightmare where he cuts his friends, families and his own throat. That one left me with a sinking feeling in my stomach. Anyways, getting to what finally prompted me to post this somewhere. My boyfriend saw a shadow person late last night, standing outside our roommate's door in the infamous hallway. I've seen it standing there in the exact same spot multiple times too. In his own words, it ignored me, like it wasn't even there. It was standing there like it was waiting for him to open the door. All I have to say is luckily, we're moving in with someone else very, very soon. <laughs> 